Mr. Eric Herian. Hello, everybody. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, Eric. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, yes. so, uh, I'm happy to, to join you and I uh, listen to Thomas' uh, discussion and I'm uh, happy to present also our projects because we have similar activities related to the deployment of uh, LTE private networks. And so I'm going to introduce you uh, the context in which uh, we are working on uh, industrial IoT for nuclear. and. Uh, uh, my uh, position in EDF is uh, in uh, EDF R&D and I'm dealing with a, a project which is uh, named Elliot and uh, which is about evolution of IoT and uh, we are uh, uh, focusing in this project on uh, solutions for the nuclear sector but also for hydro power plants and uh, for our windmills and uh, so what I'm going to present to you is uh, the focus on nuclear activities and uh, I will. Uh, do you do you see my slides? Is that uh, do you have? Yes. Please. Yes. Okay. Great. Good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a 4G private network project, which is called in EDF uh, Connect. And uh, uh, this uh, project started. Uh, I would say it started um, maybe in 2015 with the regulation decisions that were made only in 2019 which have uh, enabled us to, to deploy uh, these uh, networks. And the decision was made in 2021 March to deploy this in all our power plants and including our dismantling power plants. And so the, the project is uh, star it started uh, in uh, 2020 with the deployment of a pilot on, uh, on a power plant which is uh, based in southwest of France. And uh, these, uh, this power plant was uh, equipped with uh, LTE systems in year 2021 with uh, tests that, that were uh, uh, validated. And the main reasons why we decided to deploy these uh, uh, was uh, similar to Fortune, is uh, end of life of our DECT networks. And also uh, we have Tetra networks and we have included the evolution of our Tetra networks towards uh, these uh, MCPTT uh, uh, systems to be connected. And also we have some metaging uh, research of persons that were uh, end of life also. And all these uh, main applications were hosted in this uh, new network. So now uh, the Blaye power plant uh, is running with uh, this network. We have like 2000 users, simultaneous users that are actively using it now. And uh, we are uh, deploying these uh, networks at the rhythm of, uh, I would say next year will be 2022, it will be three power plants, uh, three sites. And uh, we aim at uh, having everything uh, uh, within five years. And uh, with uh, all the, the sites that you see on this map uh, being equipped with uh, this design. And so uh, what we are uh, dealing with is now the decision on what, what to do and how to host IoT uh, systems in these uh, de design. And so today uh, IoT is uh, deployed mainly based on, on LoRa1 systems and wireless art uh, systems. And so uh, what we are deploying today is, I would say, the, the collect platforms. So we have made the decision to have virtual machines in all our power plants and deployment will be over in 2022 with uh, the collection capacity of, uh, uh, of systems like LoRa1 or wireless art and to be interconnected to our IoT platform. So we have network servers that are currently uh, deployed in all our sites and uh, the national rollout should be over more or less in 2022. Uh, we had an option to activate NB-IoT in our power plants, but due to the market, the ecosystem of these uh, networks, we are not deploying right now this solution and this decision will be made uh, in parallel with all, with all our investigation on 5G integration. So these 5G integration studies 
are currently done and we are uh, thinking that uh, we have better understanding of the market and the consequences in 2024 to, to generalize or not uh, some uh, requirements. And some of our requirements are related to the bands we are using. So we have uh, uh, two bands here that we are using. Mainly the sub gigahertz band will be useful for IoT and because uh, there is no real ecosystem for uh, systems over uh, one gigahertz, in particular when you are using the TDD mode. And the other mode is the band 38 which is uh, between 2570 and 2620. It's a private band that was uh, regulated in 2019 on which we are uh, uh, deploying all our systems. And uh, so for IoT integration, one of our questions is which security level we are going to enable and which network is going to be unleaded. So today, uh, LoRaWAN is deployed. So we are uh, some gateways which are connected into the systems, but there is no massive deployment of these LoRaWAN networks in our power plants. And we have some, uh, some questions sometimes, like uh, you have this picture here, you have an analog sensor, you can put a digital uh, uh, sensor on it to, to just uh, transmit the, these values. But if you need these, uh, these sensors for control assistance or in, uh, they are integrated in INC, we cannot deploy that kind of system so easily. So the, all these questions are currently under uh, discussions and that, that will, will make us the, the ability to, to deploy this IoT network uh, for year uh, uh, 22 maybe with the decision of which network to really generalize. So, how do we uh, tackle the issue of IoT integration in our organization? We have uh, what we call these uh, building blocks. So uh, uh, integration of IoT means uh, platforms, architectures to, to decide with, to integrate. We also have uh, objects that have uh, to be connected with the gateways. And these uh, objects, and oh, sorry, I missed. Uh, these uh, objects have uh, some uh, operating systems, some uh, intelligence in it, and so we have to decide how to manage these kind of objects. And we really differentiate our activities uh, with regards to operating networks and private networks. And uh, a transversal brick is related to cybersecurity because cybersecurity is everywhere in these issues. And so we, we have lots of activities related to IoT, uh, which is uh, the verticals that you see here. Uh, how do we address lo the location services? Are they going to be part of, of our cellular networks or are we going to deploy a specific infrastructure for these services? We have edge computing, which is really uh, linked also to embedded AI. And uh, we have to, to have some microservers or some objects that are going to host these, uh, these systems. And so there are uh, issues on it. And we have also all these activities is on uh, high bit rate services to be linked or not with IoT. And uh, computer vision is also a very important uh, uh, solution that is emerging and which is making uh, some uh, discussion on how to integrate computer vision with IoT services, for instance. And uh, an another brick that you see here is the management of security elements. This is related to uh, the, the SIM, uh, we could say, because SIM is going to be embedded in our were objects, and this is really a big issue to host these kind of systems when you speak about objects. So uh, these uh, these integrations are to be also investigating with uh, which service security level we're going to address with uh, our infrastructure. So that's also an organization we have for, for this. So I'm going to, to present you some uh, use case that we have related to IoT. And in our chart, we, we use uh, some uh, internal steps to, to say where we are with our use cases. Do we have only identified use cases? And we have, for instance, like 47 use cases that are identified, but gains are not so much well uh, uh, addressed. We have uh, 10, 10 use cases where we have uh, good gains uh, with which are identified and how to, to address and some ideas on the technical integration. 
And we, we uh, on this uh, chart, we also uh, pilot phase. When we have pilot phase, it means that uh, these systems are really validated and are more or less uh, at the end ready for catalog integration. And what you can see is that we have no, uh, no nothing in catalog integration. Why? Because we do not have the networks which are ready today and massively available available for uh, being deployed. So the decisions today for IoT deployment are really based on one power plant, what they want to do really uh, today, and there is no, uh, I would say, national view on how to deploy this in all our power plants, and there is no global decision to, to deploy that service on that network uh, and generalize it. So that's why we could say that we have no catalog integration, but at least we have some use cases that are uh, quite uh, well uh, tested today. And so I'm going to uh, to give you some examples on these uh, use cases. Uh, one is with uh, uh, the valve leakage quantification. And for this, we need a digital twin. And that's the technical uh, 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 issue to address here. Uh, and it's important. Another one is uh, the detection of leakages in this. And uh, that's why uh, these two uh, use cases which are transformer chairs and uh, valve leakage detection are more or less uh, similar in in the sense that we need to refer to temperature charts operations and we compare these to normal and then we can say where and when we have problems with uh, these uh, things so there is no real digital twin in it uh, another one is more about uh, interconnecting uh, uh, existing systems, like for instance, our air quality monitoring systems today are mod based, based, but there is no remote control on it, and so we are going to extend it with LoRa One. And thanks to this uh, LoRa One interconnection, we have better management of these uh, systems. That's more or less the same for max time of exposure in the machine holes. We have a high temperature, high hygrometry to 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 monitor. And these ones are going to be linked in real time, and that that will enable us uh, these um, uh, these uh, better management of IoT. So, uh, uh, in more detail, I'm going to give you on the valve uh, leakage. Uh, why do we do this? Is uh, really to to locate some lead losses in our systems and uh, also to optimize our shutdown maintenance. And uh, we want to address when and where to, to act uh, uh, for the right valves. And so for this, what we do is we install one to three temperature sensors on the different parts of the valve, and we're going to follow the evolution of the temperature. And we have uh, some charts which give us some recommendations on the normal operation and when to expect some abnormal situations. And we rely on these charts to de decide if we have a suspicion or a good uh, indication of leakages. And so these are uh, uh, some uh, use cases that are, we, we, you see here, it's pilot phase, so it's ready to be deployed. It's uh, validated on a, uh, one power plant. Uh, this power plant has uh, uh, deployed the right gateway and the, the right system to, to make it available in some parts of the power plant. And it's, it would be ready for generalization when, when we have all the, uh, the collection chain, which is ready. And so uh, the main discussion will be on the network to use. So today it's based on row one systems. We have a modem which is gathering these uh, valve temperature sensors and transmission is done through our collection platform. And we, we have these uh, data analytics platforms that are available to, 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 to terminate the flow. Uh, so th that's uh, uh, this first example. The, the other example is more on leakage uh, quantification. So in that uh, case, uh, it's more related to the bypass condenser valves. In this uh, situation, uh, detection of leakage is not enough uh, uh, to decide uh, how to maintain the, the valves, and we need more insight on which internal parts to, to replace. And so uh, for this, really, we really need uh, this quantification. So how do we do it? We, we deploy eight sensors on the pipe, and we define uh, a model on 
which we can see how the temperature should evaluate uh, in the right manner and how to quantify uh, which uh, 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 leakage uh, is uh, associated. And so here we use uh, either wireless hard systems or lower one, and we use our IT platform to, to, to make it available. Uh, today, be, due to COVID, we had not really the budget to, 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 to finalize everything. So we still have to work on the interconnection of the digital twin. And so there is more uh, integration to do, to, to do on this. And so that's why we are more on the technical integration phase for this use case. Another uh, use case is what we call the fragile protection. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in nuclear power plants, but uh, what uh, I think in the assembly, you know what, what it is, but it, it's related to, to the, the freezing that is observed in our pumping station to cool the systems. And so if we have inefficient uh, suction to cool the secondary circuit, it's really an important uh, accident and uh, that could lead to core meltdown. So in order to do this, there's, there is this fragile protection. So how it is working today. So if you have no fragile protection, you pump your water from the river and then uh, the cooling system is uh, doing its job. But if ever you have uh, some fragile protection to, to, to put in place, then you need to re-inject some hot water that you, you eject from your cooling system. And this host water is warming the, the cooling water and the cooling, cooling potential is decreased. So you don't have the same efficiency. And as a matter of fact, you cannot run your reactor power in uh, the, the best uh, way. That's normal because uh, you don't have such a good, uh, uh, a good cooling system. So in order to, to do this, you need uh, to, to say when to remove this protection. And we do not have the right indication today with this. And so that's why we have made a test and we add just, a, it's a simple design. We add a temperature sensor in another part of the river uh, at, the, at the upstream of the flow. And it's giving ind indication on when we could uh, exactly remove the protection. Of course, it's not, uh, it's not involving the, uh, the security of the system because when we want to remove the protection, we have to manually make uh, other uh, temperature decisions because our system are not uh, uh, with the, uh, the right security level. But at least it's giving the right time to, 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 to decide when to do it and we have a good uh, evolution of the temperature for this. So the, this is a, a pilot. And uh, this is giving good uh, good help for uh, for this uh, decision. Uh, another uh, use case we have it's and it's really related to what we have today. So we have a 4G network. We have uh, the ability to use uh, some bitrate on this network. We have scans from our power plants, and we want. Uh, 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 um, location service in, in these power plants. One location service which is important for us is, for instance, radio protection and link uh, those rate measurements with our location. But it's also very important for logistics. And we, we want to know how to deploy these RTLS systems. Uh, these ones are quite expensive and uh, our cellular network are not going to provide the right uh, uh, solution for the tracking of IoT objects. So we need to, to think about uh, alternative solutions. And one of the alternative solutions is what we call visual positioning systems, where we analyze uh, our picture and then we can more or less decide where to, to put the location on the map. And in order to do this, we uh, synchronize our picture with our scans and we decide and we are in a position to, to, to decide when, when this uh, blue point could be display. So today it's more or less a static service that we, we are designing, but we also uh, 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 target a dynamic service, which uh, would help uh, some workers to have a camera on them and then have location tracking thanks to these cameras. So that, that's a pre-study that we are doing on this and uh, is giving first uh, results are encouraging for, for this, but it's really relying on our, our 3D scans uh, solutions. Another uh, uh, solution we are investigating is uh, the alerting system for workers under lifting dangers. And so we have rules uh, which are defining two zones. The, the blue one is where we, you are the, 
that's uh, the the footprint of the load and you should not be under this load and the red one is uh, the the forbidden zone and uh, which radius is uh, equal to the elevation of the hook and in order to to have these uh, two zones well managed uh, we are uh, working on uh, the stereoscopic edge with the ability to track some people and uh, we also are investigating lidar and on these uh, two parts we are able to provide some features to 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 track hook and to track the loads and the workers and decide where to our left and when it's under situation so it's really under press study it's not ready at all but it's it's another use case on how to use our networks uh, on this. Uh, so what what our uh, what are our challenge uh, today? Uh, that's uh, uh, lots of uh, issues are related to uh, our private cellular network. Uh, for instance, the eSIM integration is a uh, is a situation where you have some problems to to buy uh, some standard objects as we do it today for lower one systems for instance you when you buy a device on lower one market you can decide to to inject it on an operating network or a private network with no problem there is no issue it's uh, easy to handle with cyber security it's good with uh, nbiot uh, devices that you want to inject on a private cellular network it's really an issue on how to bootstrap the device and how to have a low-cost eSIM server on it. And so we, we are working on the solutions to, to try to, to well handle this, and also the IoT safe environment applications to, uh, to have some security based on the eSIM. There are also discussion on how to roam between our sites and between public networks, and how to have these services on this. Uh, localization, as I told you, is an important issue. Uh, it's uh, really uh, important when you want to, to have this working on IoT and also on smartphones. And uh, the, these are not so easy to, to tackle. And the infrastructure, uh, there is uh, some cost reduction that could help if ever we had an open infrastructure. And uh, how to design better local cabling on this. Uh, it's not easy. And uh, maybe we we have uh, more solutions in 2025 uh, along the, the project, but today it's not available at all on, on these uh, challenges. And the other challenge is uh, on uh, embedded AI. How do we address uh, the integration of, uh, uh, I would say, models on uh, low, re low, low resources systems? So uh, we, we have uh, some models that we would like to embed in some uh, uh, objects. And so we, we need uh, a platform which is targeting different devices and which is uh, uh, enabling the, the integration with a, a frugal learning, meaning that we don't have so many uh, data uh, to, to, uh, to give to the object, but at least we want it to work with that kind of data. Uh, we also have, uh, as it was stated, uh, the, the problem of uh, cloud technologies coming into our environments. So uh, more and more gateways or things like this uh, should be run uh, based on the microservice ecosystem. And we need a standard for this. So we are active on uh, how to have some standards on edge computing. And uh, as I told you, uh, computer vision is really uh, a kind of killer application for IoT integration with uh, low power sensors, which will enable us to, to have some services, as we told you, on uh, visual uh, uh, po positioning systems or uh, uh, safety for uh, lifting zones. Uh, these are really based on uh, the fact that we hope computer vision will help us on this. Uh, uh, well, another word that I would like to address is uh, about integration of objects. Uh, uh, so, for instance, today we are deploying our objects on uh, based on QR code with LoRaWAN, but the LoRaWAN standard on QR code is not so much efficient because it's not addressing the ability to, to change of networks. And so this is a big issue. We are part of the LoRaWAN alliance to make it uh, more, more proof on this uh, situation and also uh, we want this to work on any uh, system. And so cellular has to also address this 
kind of uh, deployment. One uh, important issue is also the ability to 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 uh, manage the devices uh, on their local interface. Uh, so when we deploy devices today, we have lots of couples which are very heterogeneous. For instance, we have a padlock on which we need a dongle to 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 make it work and to to be able to manage it or update it. Another one is having an Android application which is very specific and uh, proprietary, and so we have to address how to 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 know how to to evaluate the security of these uh, objects. Uh, other ones, for instance, uh, it's not so much in nuclear, but it's a CO2 sensor that we are deploying in our uh, buildings and in, include not industrial zones. But we had to develop a Python application just to be able to to roll out that kind of device because we had to roll out like 2,000 devices of this. And so that's uh, that's really an issue on uh, industrial IoT on how to configure the devices and how to calibrate them, how to update them. And so one of the, the, the standards we want to address is something which is uh, coming from the Scandinavian world, I would say. It's uh, supported uh, by uh, actors, for instance, in uh, Ericsson environment, all this. is the OAuth uh, ACE standard, where you have uh, authorization server, which is giving and granting access uh, through a smartphone. And thanks to the smartphone, you're going to be uh, uh, possible access to, to your object. And uh, this object has not to be connected to the network, and that's very important in IoT. And so we really hope this standard will will be adopted in nuclear uh, activities, so that we have a single way to manage our devices, and then we will simplify our certification of IoT devices. Because it's another uh, issue: is how are we going to authorize uh, objects to enter our networks? And how do we certify them? Today, it's a really heavy work that is done by our cyber teams. And we know that it's not scalable. And so we know that uh, European certification is uh, addressing this uh, thanks to uh, the Cyber Act and the creation of this group under ENISA. But it's important to know how we are going to be able to, to deploy massive uh, industrial IoT. And another subject is how to activate on cellular networks uh, the the, uh, the cyber security because today it's uh, making our devices not uh, autonomous it's making like 30 percent more uh, consumption of the devices and so it's important to have uh, strategies on which protocols we're going to accept and how we are going to integrate these and protocols into our platforms and so I, I think I'm over with this I, I know I had not so much time I'm a uh, I'm happy to answer your questions, and uh, I don't know if I, I think I had not so much more time. Am I right on the timing? Yeah. I think we have like one minute for a question. So if there is a short question, <laughs> I had a short question, and starting with a comment. Every time I hear a presentation from EDF, I'm like blown away because you are so fantastic in doing all of these interesting things, regardless of what subject we are discussing. It's always fantastic and, and, and having this big fleet that you have that you can do a pilot in one place and then just distribute things and implement an entire fleet that's fantastic yeah i i think we have this advantage to 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 share between different power plants i think it's a good um yes okay thank you i noticed that you had uh, 47 uh, use cases that you sort of started how many of these do you expect to get all the way to sort of the last step? Yeah. Well, our intention is to have all these uh, to the last step. The, the problem is the really on uh, uh, industrial IoT is to, to put the right gains. And you know, when, when you define the gains of this use case, there are always people who are telling you, yes, maybe you made an error on this and you are facing some lots of discussions on uh, what what are the right gains and how did you consider the deployment of the network or not and uh, so the, the problem we have with uh, this uh, industrial IoT integration is that there is no one single killer application to deploy IoT and you need to share these gains on all and that's why we don't have these networks uh, deployed because I, I believe that people don't consider that these networks uh, are too expensive to 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 activate 
solve these use cases. But uh, our intention to uh, uh, is to really progress on this. And uh, we, we must say that we had uh, some cost reduction due to COVID crisis and uh, emergency situation to, to deal with, uh, meaning that uh, uh, we were delayed in these uh, use case uh, studies and uh, value to give. And we hope uh, that uh, they will be addressed in the next years, uh, all, all of them, and uh, identify more also because, you know, it's never ending story on these use cases, and uh, we hope that thanks to the network, then they will have applications and then we have more network power. And it's always a question of applications and network infrastructure. Mm -hmm.